Well, I, I first got drunk. This is not to say that I um, continue to get drunk on a daily basis by any means, but uh, I first got drunk uh, at the age of 18, I think it was, on Pim's number one. And I came down here to the Charwell River, which is looking a bit brown uh, right now and uh, ugly. And uh, I got in a punt and I fell in the river. It's, it, it was a very wonderful uh, experience, I think. Um, uh, and some people on the bank said, oh, look, he's falling in the river. He's falling in the water. And uh, asked me to jump again, which I did. They took a photograph of me and uh, sent me some prints, much to my surprise. I very well remember the first day. I remember really the hour that I met Dudley Moore uh, at Oxford. I was a freshman and he'd been there a couple of years ahead of me uh, because I, like so many of uh, my contemporaries, had done national service. And it was outside Magdalen College, and we were introduced by Anthony Page, the director. And I must say, even at that very fragmentary meeting, it was very short, uh, Dudley was then and remained the funniest man I ever met at Oxford. And I remember him very well telling me that he was invited to a, a, a rather nice party at, at Christ Church or New College or somewhere. And, and when he came in, all the guests were sitting around in a semicircle in front of him, as if, he said, you know, waiting for the show to begin. And uh, he very quickly uh, acquired this reputation. You know, will you come to cocktails at 6.30? Or will you come to Sherry? Or will you have a late night uh, dinner in, in my rooms? Dudley Moore will be there. And it really was, you know, his Dudley Moore to entertain you. Dudley, you had a really good audience behind you. For example, people wanted him to do cabaret. He was a great star in cabaret, with all the commemoration balls and all those sort of things that went on. And uh, of course, if you could get him for a play or for the summer review, and that's how I met him in the summer of 1957. It was at the Playhouse, and it was also a review which we subsequently took to Edinburgh. Dudley was the, the musical linchpin uh, of it all. Again, he played the piano and he did his famous turns, uh, turns which were going to go around the world and become really famous, turns like Colonel Bogey. And he was working at the time, too, on a lot of the material, like the Benjamin Britten stuff. I finally decided in my third year what I wanted to do. I, and third year was not a good time to have a career decision because, you know, it's the time when you do all your exams, which is um, another reason why I stayed on for fourth year, because I felt that I could uh, um, exercise what I had decided in my third year, which was that I would go on a stage because I had done a review in Oxford um, uh, where I was intoxicated by the audience's reaction and the applause and the laughter and all that sort of thing. I was intoxicated by everything, it seems, in those days. Beyond the Fringe, with the original cast of Alan Bennett, Peter Cook, Jonathan Miller, and Dudley Moore. Yes. When are you off to America? Uh, I'm going in the next couple of days, actually, so I thought I'd better brush up my Star Spangled Banner. Yes. Well, you have to. You have to be able to play that, otherwise they won't give you a visa. Mm -hmm. uh, terribly sticky about that. Mm -hmm. Toscanini waited for years and years. Mm -hmm. 
Mind you, you can see their point of view. If they didn't have these regulations, any old riffraff could get in. Yeah. <laughs> They've got a lot of riffraff there already, haven't they? We uh, were brought together uh, for, the, uh, for the Edinburgh Festival, and we were brought together uh, by the official uh, festival, who, and I think the management of the official festival had got rather fed up with the success of the, of the university reviews. And uh, so I think what they'd, what they'd done was to go and look through, I suppose, reviews of the last four years and find out the people who had done well in their university shows in the previous four years. And uh, that, that was really how it was, it, it, it was, a, it was a sort of, it was, it was, it was just a, a, a sort of speculative venture on the part of the, of, of the festival. They had no idea that it was going to work or what it was going to do or what sort of thing it was going to be. Back in. Sorry to drag you away from the fun, old boy. It's all right, sir. War's not going very well, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're two down, the ball's in the enemy court. Yeah. War is a psychological thing, Perkins, rather like a game of football. Yes, sir. You know how in a game of football, ten men often play better than eleven? Yes, sir. Perkins? We're asking you to be that one man. Sir. Perkins? Sir. I want you to lay down your life. Yes, sir. We need a futile gesture at this stage. <laughs> It'll raise the whole tone of the war. <laughs> Get up in a crate, Perkins. Sir. Hop over to Bremen. Yes, sir. Take a shift there. Yes. Then come back. I'd rather. <laughs> Goodbye, Perkins. God, I wish I was going too. Goodbye, sir. Or is it au revoir? No, Perkins. <laughs> it's terribly hard to explain the immediate success of it in 1961. Uh, it was as if the audience was waiting for that sort of thing, although they didn't know what they were waiting for. Uh, we knew something odd had happened on that night in 1961 when we went on to the stage of the Lyceum Theatre, and there was a sort of uh, a size and an intensity of laughter which m made us feel that something odd had happened, that, the, the, that it wasn't just simply like a good footlights show, that something rather special had happened, and that by putting the four of us together, who came from such different areas, uh, we had created something which was much greater than the sum of our four contributions. But in the event, what happened was something so beyond the expectations of the critics. The great thing I remember, the first big thing I remember about uh, the, the, the four was that they were, they were very funny, very, very funny indeed, but they had meaning in their funniness. There was satire, a word now over-abused, of course. Um, they had intelligence. They had t t t t their, their, their jokes were not just jokes. They were intelligent jokes. They are people, uh, people who could laugh and have a, have a meaning in the, in the laughter they provoked. And that was the first and most important thing. And then I realized that this was something different altogether. That this, they, they'd moved laughter onto another plane altogether. And that, I think, was the, was the, basic of, the basis of their enormous success, because uh, we hadn't had anything uh, like that before. And I think audiences felt the better than for themselves, if you see what I mean. That, that they had understood it. They'd, they'd, it was not just a, a string of jokes. It was something um, that was uh, significant to them. And things that are significant are rarely funny. But this time, they were.